coaching other people and helping other people enjoy a game and therefore be happier in life was quite a big thing to me. And I think after it happened, I think my coaching changed. I don't think I was so obsessed with score anymore. I wasn't obsessed with helping people drop handicaps and become better golfers as such. I became much more sure that I was helping them enjoy it and be happier. Hi and welcome to Golf Yourself Healthy, the community of golfers who are unified in their belief that golf is good for you. I'm your host, Chris Lynch. Join me and invited guests as we share stories around how golf is helping us to live happy, healthy and fulfilled lives. If you'd like to join our community, why not follow us on your podcast platform of choice and be notified of new episodes as soon as they're released. Please also check out our back catalogue of journal articles written by myself at GolfYourselfHealthy.com. In this week's episode, we are in conversation with Katie Dawkins, advanced PGA professional and one of Golf Monthly's top 50 coaches. Katie has plenty of skin in the game, having played to a very high standard during her formative years of golf and has personally been coached by some of the most reputable names in the business, including Sky Sports' Tim Barter. In this conversation, we chat golf, life, grief, mental health and lots of other things in between. Katie has a unique and progressive coaching philosophy, which I would describe as holistic and human-centred. In other words, she places the person she's coaching at the front and centre of the coaching experience, focusing on her students' why for playing golf, and using that to shape and mould a training plan, which benefits them not just in their golf, but in their daily lives too. Katie also openly talks about living with ADHD and how that affects her golf and day-to-day life. She also shares about the loss of her son, Teddy, who passed away at the tender age of one years old in January 2016, following a short battle with cancer. One of my key takeaways from this episode, and as is reflected in the episode title and indeed the short audio clip you've just heard, is that Katie's outlook on golf and life has changed as a result of her life experiences. She has a fresh perspective on golf, not just in the way she coaches, but also in the way she plays the game and how inclusive she is towards encouraging others to not only get into golf, but to support and build up our peers so that they get enjoyment out of and a sense of belonging in golf. I do really expect that when you listen to this episode, you'll come out of it with a real spring in your step and a renewed sense of hope and confidence about your game of golf and your game of life too. But without any further ado, let's tee off and jump into the conversation. Katie, I'll say firstly, welcome to the Golf Yourself Healthy podcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you for agreeing to be our guest. Thank you to you and to the team at Caversham, the Caversham, where we find ourselves today for having us and hosting us here. Let's talk a a little bit first of all about our our hosting venue today. So tell us all about the Caversham. So the Caversham, which is the home of Reading Golf Club, the two golf clubs became one basically when... This site was built, it's a new clubhouse. As you can see, you probably walked in and went, wow, this is nice. And Gary Stango, who is the general manager, and I have been in touch for a few years. And yeah, I love, love coming here. But this is the kind of golf club that golf clubs should aspire to. It's mm-hmm. really friendly, really welcoming, but also it, it just feels like anyone could come here and have breakfast. The menu's lovely. You look at the bar, it feels like you're at a leisure club. You've got smoothie menus. You've got, you know, freshly baked cakes. And the golf course is stunning. I'm sure you looked out the window and had a little a little peek. But Tom McBroom, who's a Canadian golf architect, he redesigned it. And you'll see the bunkers have got this beautiful fescue. It's got a wild look about it. And I absolutely love that. It's, yeah, it's quite inspiring being out there. And the course is in beautiful condition. They've hosted Clutch Tour recently in the last few months, Tillman Trophy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the Tillman was here a couple of weeks ago. And I think the feedback they got about the course was phenomenal. Nice. So definitely worth coming and having a game. Maybe we'll do that next time. 
Yeah, no, that, that sounds good. Um, no, I would love to do that. Well, I mean, the weather's not looking too fantastic at the moment. No. I haven't brought my clubs with me today. Happy but if, British if we, summertime. Exactly, right? <laughs> How's your classic August day in, in, in summer in Britain? But um, yeah, well, maybe we walk, I'll maybe walk around the corner. If it's not too busy, I'll take a look. And, yeah, go and have a little Go, a go have a, a little look. So something you just said there, um, I agree. I mean, I think in the time I've really been into my golf and visited various places up and down you know the UK Scotland England Wales wherever like I've I've got a good range and a sense of like the feel in different golf clubs now and yeah I can tell walking through the front door of this one even just driving in the front gates gave me a sense of what was in store and it hasn't disappointed I think the custom you know the welcome at the front door yeah They know what they're doing here, clearly, it would seem. But I think everyone who is involved is very welcoming to everybody. It's not got that traditional sense of... Sometimes, like you said, you walk in and go, oh, it's like walking into a local pub. You're not from the area. Everyone turns around and goes, what are they doing here? And it's not like that at all. And you mentioned Janelle. Janelle came here for some coaching with me. And exactly that. She was hugging everyone. It was like, <laughs> Gary was like, way. Um, yeah. It was, it was just felt welcome. And, and I think that's really important because you go somewhere and you don't feel welcome. We've talked about that, the two of us, about being at clubs where you just don't feel welcome. There are cliques, there mm. are, there's animosity, there's, there's just a funny little air about the place where you just don't feel like you're necessarily belonging mm. there. And I think it's important for all golf clubs to create an environment or an atmosphere where people freely walk in, whether they've been there or not, and they're accepted exactly the same way as a favourite member. I don't think they have favourite members here. <laughs> but you know what I mean. It's, it's I you feel like a part of the family straight away. And for me, working here, so I coach here mm-hmm. normally every other week or at least once or twice a month. And I feel part of the family. That's rare in my profession as well. Because there's no territory, there's no, I don't feel like a threat to anyone. It's just lovely. Yeah. So let's talk more about you, your, you know, you, you as a coach, as a golf instructor then. So tell, give us a, a sense of your background and how you've got to where you are today. So I think I, I mentioned with my playing, I played a lot of golf. Yeah. Got down to four as an amateur, mm-hmm. but had absolutely no inclination to go into, certainly no inclination to go and play on tour. I could hit a ball, but recently learned I've got ADHD which explains so much it explains my entire life basically and my inability to stay focused for 18 holes I can help people with that but myself I found myself darting off in different directions mentally so four was my handicap and that was by the way down to chipping in my back garden with my brother for the majority of our teenage years but I had really luckily had Tim Barter as my coach so Mm -hmm. I also did county coaching and England regional coaching with him. And I used to gently eavesdrop and um, listen in to what he was telling everyone else. And like I said, he used to get a bit of a buzz going, oh, I totally understand this. This is amazing. But I used to love watching him help people. Mm-hmm. And you can see someone coming in being completely down in the dumps about their golf game and leaving with a spring in their step. And, you know, Tim doing cartwheels basically around them going, yes, this is amazing. You see how much he loved it. And I think that inspired me to want to do it. And it wasn't until he said, would you like to come? You keep watching me. I think you'd noticed I wasn't necessarily working on my own game enough. Um, You keep watching me. Would you like to come and work for me? Mm. And I was interested in the fact he wrote articles as well for magazines because I loved writing. And... I think I was thinking about doing psychology at university or maybe fine art because I love painting. But he said, do you want to come work for me? I said, yeah, do you know what? Yes, let's do it. And we kind of hatched a plan that there are a lot of women want a woman, a female coach. A lot Mm -hmm. of women want to be taught by a woman. That's not across the board, but there was certainly at that time not many. We were quite rare. We were a bit like rocking horse poo. It was. It was so a. Is that quite balanced then? Almost the the kind of uh, woman preferring a woman coach versus other women who will be quite open to. Male yeah, coach, yeah. I would in say, your I, experience, um, 
I'd say that when I first started out, I did teach predominantly a lot of women. Okay. But then I... Was I that almost intentional or no, was it just so really. happened that ha- happened, happened organically? Kind yeah, of thing? it happened organically yeah. and a lot of... And Tim said it would, you know, he said that a lot of women will want to be taught by a woman. So you've got your market there yeah. straight away. Okay. But actually, the guys that I teach tend to appreciate the practical advice rather than lengthy technical explanations and stats and everything else and numbers. They actually want to know why they can't hit that ball over the bunker, how they can put the bunker out of their minds and not think about it. And they like the simplicity of it. So it's not that I don't know exactly what happens in the golf swing. I do, but I'm not going to explain 12 points of it to somebody and expect them to remember it. So I think that idea of not having to tap your head, rub your stomach and hit a golf ball at the same time, people seem to relate to that. And I like it to be simple. I like to have simple explanations. And if someone gets slightly complicated, I kind of glaze over Mm. (laughs) in anything, not just in golf, in anything. I lose interest very quickly. Right. So my, my coaching went from there. I wrote for Women in Golf magazine for years. That's how I met Alison Root from um, Golf Monthly now. Mm -hmm. And then she and I ended up working together at Golf Monthly. So I I love that element of my job. I love the presenting. I love giving instruction to camera so that we can share it. That's fabulous. And it's quite a new thing for me, that. But I want to explore that more as well. And you're a natural at it. I can tell if I may say so. I only because I've just, in the (laughs) short time I've known you, I, you know, I see, uh, you know, obviously, you know, I do a bit of research on my guests and in preparation for coming up, you know, we are worried out. about what you've watched. No, 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 no. In the re- in recent days and weeks, you know, just even um, you seem to recognize the importance of a certain energy that you bring to a camera because, again, I've I've been coached by a few different people over the years and I now I think have examples of what good looks like and what not so good looks yeah. like. You know, turning up at a golf coach, for example, who you'll pay to speak to you for 40 minutes and you barely get to hold a club or, you know, but yeah. you're the, so, so my question that lead on, leads on from this then is like that presenting, which you've just said you, you love, have you found, is that just like a natural, is that a skill that you've just discovered that you already had, or is it something you've had to actively work on developing? I blame Alison Root for this as well, um, because she and I were shooting at the Grove Um, with Paul Seven, who is a fantastic photographer um, in the industry. And I remember her suddenly saying, by the way, we need to do videos. And I went, how what? (laughs) And she did not, I don't think she'd explained it. She probably had and I'd probably forgotten. But so I found that I suddenly had to talk to the camera. And I think it was Paul that said, just give me a golf lesson. Just talk to me like I'm your pupil. And that really helped. And I think I've just taken that on from there and I did the first couple of videos and I think we only did one take and he went yeah great afterwards I went well well, now I must have said something wrong must have done something and it just feels really natural Mm. I enjoy it and if I overthink it if I have a script I've done shoots where it's just been myself and a and a photographer and a videographer and I've actually gone I really probably not don't need to wing this Mm. so and that's me not trusting what I already know and I've got a lot in my mind, but if you said to me, can you tell me this person's phone number, I'd be able to tell it, and I still don't know why. But if you asked me what I'd just said to you 10 minutes ago, I wouldn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. It's like Dory. (laughs) (laughs) But when it comes to giving golf lessons, I think we all do this. We all doubt ourselves. We doubt how much we know, and we doubt our knowledge sometimes. But when someone sticks a camera in front of me, I just go, blah, 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 blah. And somehow I then stand at the end going, what did I just say? What, what, what just happened? <laughs> and it, I, re, I listen to it back and I go, oh, that's okay, actually. But if I think about it and I script it, I'm, I'm screwed. <laughs> well, you clearly... Overthinking is not to- something I need to be doing. Totally. So what is Katie Dawkins' coaching philosophy? What could one expect if someone rocks up here tomorrow to get a lesson from Katie? I'm hoping that someone would go away with a much clearer idea of what they want golf to give them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's not being really deep and spiritual, but I think a lot of people rock up and go, I need help with my driving. I want my ball to go further. And you kind of go, well, okay, but why? 
because I want to score better. Why? Because I want to enjoy the game. Okay, well, that's actually the reason that you need to be improving Mm -hmm. because you're getting ratty because your ball keeps going out of bounds. And so I want that person to leave having a really clear idea of why they do what they do. And I think, again, that was something that was drummed into me early on was the person you're coaching has to understand what they're doing and what the root cause is, not just the move in the golf swing, because I think a lot of pros jump straight to the swing, whereas actually probably 90% of the faults stem from how you're setting up to it. And so as long as that person realises they've got to do X, Y, Z, or just X, hopefully, in their setup, and that will then lead to them killing many birds with one stone, then I'm happy. And they're going away with a very simple explanation, a reason why, and also some practical advice that they're actually going to use. So... I love giving like a parachute drill, I call it. So something on the golf course where they go, oh, it's happened again. Okay, I need to go back to doing this drill. And it reinforces what we've been working on just through a movement and a feeling rather than, oh, what did I do there? Did my elbow do this? Did my hip do this? Did my little finger do this? It, it needs to be very simple and very practical. Otherwise, people get overwhelmed, mm-hmm. like with anything in, in life. Yeah. It just too much information is too much yeah. information and often one piece of advice can send someone out and I always look at the way that people leave golf lessons and their body language because we all know that if you've got a spring in your step you're having a good day yeah, yeah. you can see somebody from a mile off who hates bunkers on the golf course because they slump in like <laughs> it's just soft yeah. walking and going oh my god and they look at the sky and ask you know, the heavens, why? Why have I ended up Why? In here? Not again. This is the one place I was trying to avoid. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So I talk a lot about using body language as well. So I think, I think, yeah, my coaching philosophy is to improve that person's life, not just their golf. I don't want to just mm. be a golf coach. I, there was a, I mean, it was years ago now, something you said there, I remember, could have been Golf Monthly, I can't remember what golf magazine it was, but there was a feature on Bernard Langer where he spoke about the idea of body language and how even if you're having a bad round, mm. body language will, like, um, if you stand up straight and have a stride in your yep. step kind of thing, rather than being slouched over, yeah. you're, you know, that could be that small difference between turning the round around or... Absolutely. And although you're forcing it, that awareness of it mm. is really important. It's the same as when you answer the phone. You're supposed to smile when you answer the mm. phone. You're having a really bad day. You're working in a shop environment and again this is the whole the pga pro work in the shop do the amount of hours that you do in there but you always answer that phone with a smile on your face because they can hear that smile and so even if you're having a terrible day you go hello how can i help (laughs) and and if they could see your face it's like a grimace but it it you do feel better yeah afterwards Yeah, absolutely. Because I think there's almost this thing between like sort of, I hear some golf sports psychologists talk about the concept of almost like toxic positivity Mm. versus like actually positive self-talk. And I I personally believe anyway that what you're talking about here, what we're talking about is, yeah, again, talking to yourself in a more positive way will more often than not work out well for you out in the golf course, right? 100%. And I think this whole like take the person slumping into the bunker because they hate Mm. bunkers, go for a bunker lesson. But one of the main parts of that is the striding in. But also I think we're very bad as human beings about hooking into the negative stuff. Mm -hmm. So if someone asks you, how was your golf today? Oh, my bunkers were awful. People always say that. We were talking about how positive Americans are Mm -hmm. and how that can-do attitude. You ask ask some guys and girls in the States, how was your golf today? Oh, I hit this drive. It was amazing. I think it was on 16, but I'll remember it forever. And I think we need to be more like that. We need to talk more about the good, tell the good stories and tell a talk about the positives. I agree with you completely, but I, I feel, Katie, like, you know, there's a... You know, always got to watch talking in generalizations, but I'll just say it as I see it. I think mm-hmm. in, in, you know, in the UK, there's there's quite a strong, I don't know if it's an inherent thing, like a negativity it's bias. A and, isn't and, it? and And because of, you know, we, what you see predominantly around you, it then becomes, it, it's easier to conform to a, to a certain group 
behavior yeah. than yeah. it is to stand out from the crowd but I guess if you just try that <laughs> try that positivity you know don't yeah. don't knock it till you've tried but it I think the... it becomes quite infectious mm -hmm. in a good way mm. like having that positive mentality and talking about your positive experiences will make it okay mm -hmm. for the person sat next to you to talk about theirs mm. whereas if everyone in the room's having a moan we start to go well what could I moan about yeah. what, what story can I tell that's a bit negative whereas if someone's gone oh did anyone see the part so and so hold? And talking yeah. about other people's positives yeah. as well and bigging them up. Completely. I think that's really important. That's something we don't do enough either. So I think actually, with returning to that whole what do I love doing as a coach and why do I do it? I quite like empowering people to big other people up. That's why I love group coaching so much. Mm -hmm. The women I coach, I really encourage them in those groups to practice in twos, not because I don't want them to hit their own bay's worth of golf balls and I think we all know that's probably not a good thing anyway but I'm teaching them how to practice properly what to look out for for each other mm -hmm. which encourages them to go to the range as a team together when they're not in a lesson but also I'm encouraging them to big themselves up and big each other up and really give each other encouragement because we're always so much stronger as a team and if, sure. even in the group coaching, if we can almost create and manufacture that team, especially in women's golf, I think women need to support women more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we, I think, again, it's a, you said about UK sort of mentality or the culture. It's very easy to knock people down. Mm -hmm. Whereas actually we should be working harder on building them up. Um, this podcast is called Golf Yourself Healthy. I wanted to ask you, and this is the first time I've asked a guest this, kind of almost outright in this way. I'm genuinely curious. When I say golf yourself healthy, what words come to mind? What image does that conjure up? What does that mean to you personally? Golf yourself healthy means that you're using golf almost as a route to feeling better, not just about yourself, but within yourself. And I think when we talk about healthy, I think a lot of people immediately think active. Mm -hmm. They think physical. Mm -hmm. But I think to me, because of my background and a lot of the psychology stuff that I've worked on, but also just because of life, I think golf yourself healthy. Whenever anyone says healthy to me, I immediately jump to mind. I immediately go into my head or into how I'm feeling. And I think anyone who's had a brush with depression or had a had a brush with any you know tragedy or anything that happens in their lives that challenges them I think healthy becomes it takes a different takes on a different form uh, and I don't know if you've found that as well but certainly healthy to me and I see an apple or I see you know something where we're nourishing ourselves but it's not just a physicality mm -hmm. it's a mentality as well but then I know what golf gives people so for me, I'll take that very differently, golf yourself healthy, to somebody, if we went into the clubhouse here at the Caversham and asked someone, you should do that in a minute, um, ask someone, what does this say to you? Golf yourself healthy. What do you think it means? Maybe we'll go and ask six people. I think we ought to. I think we should. It's interesting that response you give because I think for me, yeah, I'm more likely to associate it to mental health. Mm rather than physical health. And what's probably so interesting about that, that you and I, for example, have that association with it, is I think partly, maybe something you just said, it is probably largely about personal lived experience. Mm. Because if you're not someone who has lived with, if it's a mental health condition, for example, then you may be less likely to make that association. But going back to something you said earlier, the answer that anyone gives to what golf yourself healthy means to them will be completely anchored back to their why. Yeah. Like you said, yeah. like you want to understand when you coach someone, why do you play golf? Mm. What's, what's golf giving you? I want to know why they, they're there. Why have yeah. you booked a lesson? What do you want from it? Yeah. How can, I know how I can help you, but how do you want me to help you? Yeah. And I dare say that Again, I think from experience, that's you're you're probably quite rare in <laughs> in that kind of outlook or that yeah. that 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 ethos, that philosophy. 
And I think that's perhaps maybe why that almost like that could take someone by surprise or because they've got a preconceived idea of what a golf pro is going to give them mm. kind of thing. But then I think, again, it also talks to the very fact that in our culture, we're not so deep or we don't we don't get under the hood of something and really mm. you know and I think it's because people find it quite uncomfortable maybe yeah, in a I way think people get very um yeah a bit, they're scared of it mm. because also I think there's a lot of people that know full well they box stuff away mm -hmm. and they don't deal with it and to, the idea of letting all that stuff out mm. is quite scary for some people so they just don't even go near it you mentioned that you have ADHD. Yeah. Um, is that something, because another guest of, of mine on this podcast, one of the girls in, in that, she spoke about her ADHD and, and it was just uh, illuminating just hearing how she spoke about how she can make sense of why things are yeah. the way they are and how it always used to be before and how her mind were. So, so I guess what has that, knowing that now, how has that helped you knowing and what, you know? I would love to say that I am now the most organised person, totally in control of everything and all that jazz, just because I know about it. But I'd be lying because I have days where I... I, I understand now why I have days where I totally hyper-focus and totally get probably three weeks' worth of work done in one day. I'll have days where I go, that should be what every day is like. And then I'll have a week where I'm literally wading through fudge. I can't think, I can't, I can't motivate myself. And I'm still in the stage, oh, I, I got privately diagnosed, so I'm still in the stage with my doctor to work out what, what I need. I, I, I don't want to take loads of drugs and things, although I think it might help. Mm. I don't, I'm, I'm determined, and this is the part of me that probably I need to let go of, um, I'm determined to kind of fix it through exercise. I know mm. that if I exercise, it fixes it. But because I'm not organised, and this is all part of it, I run out of time. I try and do too many things at once and never get the time to give to myself. Mm -hmm. Or I don't feel like I should have the time. I'm not allowed it. Um, and a lot of people would say to me, but you're, you're a working mum. That's surely what it's all about. And I remember even my mum said to me, she went, well, you don't have that. Because I think, and I, I remember when it was a business coach that actually highlighted it. She sat down with me to try and organise the chaos that is my work life and family life and everything else. And she looked at me and she just went, have you been diagnosed for your ADHD? And I went, pardon what? <laughs> and I was like, well, no, because that's what little boys who can't sit still have. And genuinely, I think in most people's heads, especially probably my parents' generation, that's what ADHD is. But when you dig deeper and you go, actually, in girls, girls can mask it, and they, they internalise it so much more. The boys, there's more frenetic energy and more, like, hyperactivity going on. But in girls, the, the hyperactivity is internalised into all I can describe as a swirling, not a mess, but it's a swirling load of chaos inside their minds. And when I go back to school, it was often why I would just not say anything. I would just stay very quiet. Mm. And if I did open my eyes, something weird would come out. And, and I can literally look back on my entire life and my entire childhood and go, oh my goodness, well that explains me. And those were my doctor's words when I phoned up and I thought he was going to laugh at me. When I said, look, my business coach has highlighted this. Now I've looked into it. The light bulb's gone. Ding. This is 100% where I'm at. Because um, I think I scored top scores in all the quizzes and stuff that you do and you do all the, you answer the questionnaires. And he said to me, he said, I've known you seven years. And he said, this explains you. Mm. And I, I looked right. Because I was like, I was expecting, I said to him, I was expecting you to say, don't be bloody ridiculous. You're just busy and you've had a lot going on. You've got a lot on your plate. But he went, no, well, this, this is really exciting. This explains you. Mm hmm and he then talked about the superpowers. And for anyone who knows about ADHD, you do have these incredible moments where you can... I'm, I'm pretty sure that's why I can do what I do with my coaching. It all, it's all relative. Yeah. And at some point, I will give myself the space and the time to sit down and actually write about it. Yeah. Because I think there's probably people in so many different fields that wonder why they can do stuff. Mm -hmm. Yet they're not actually achieving. They're not 
where they think they should be in that in that industry. And yeah. it's it's just interesting. I I find it fascinating. I could probably talk about it for about three days. Well, <laughs> and I won't. No, well, there's a few things that I would share back with you. One, for example, is that I've wondered, and I like, you know, I I try to talk very openly about my own mental health and things on this podcast and invite my guests to do so. And when someone like you opens up in the way that you have, it's so powerful. I think we've got to to do that because, again, like you spoke about, if I heard you right, you sort of like maybe your, your parents' generation or whatever. Like I, my parents, you know, that will openly say, yeah, back in my day like we just didn't speak about these things and, and and they're they're definitely they're very supportive of me talking about my mental health and things like that but I guess what I'm trying to say is it's very encouraging that we're living in times now where people are so willing and feel safe to be able to open up about these things I uh and that's why I think the likes of you and I should hopefully continue to role model in the way that we are I think when you describe it as a as a superpower, I love that. You know, I just, I love how, and I do hear that more and more now that people, when we talk about neurodiversity, you know, and how it's being seen as like a really positive thing. Yeah, yeah. No question. It's like, not you know, a disability I think or it, anything no, like that. It's it, far pe- from People it. who have like conditions like autism and ADHD they can, or... Yeah, they, they can do stuff other people can't. Uh, absolutely, right. And, and I think, again, it's one of those ones we're not ever trying to make it sound like, you know, well, I don't know, maybe there are people out there that say I'm grateful for my autism or I'm grateful for my age. It's not a yeah. marginal, you know, but it's kind of, I think the point here is that the more that one can discover oneself, mm. the better you understand yourself and the better able you're, you are to, 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 to apply your strengths yeah. in day-to-day life, right? So, But uh, even when I, was, when I was talking about that yeah. and I was talking about that superpowers, your eyes lit up. And yeah. you, it was like, you were like, yes, I think that's, I've got elements. And I think people can relate to it. And yeah. this is the thing with me going to Beverly Poole, who is my business coach, and she's a phenomenal mentor. And she's, I'm so grateful to her every day for highlighting and even just mentioning ADHD to me. Mm. But my initial reaction of, oh God, I haven't got that. Don't be so silly. Um, Little boys who run around and can't sit still have got it. When you start to realise there's so many different pockets of different sorts, Mm -hmm. and then you go, well, well, of course there is, because everybody's different. And this is the thing with golf as well, is you can't pigeonhole people into into a square peg hole when they're not square peg hole golfers. They don't, not, nobody fits in the same mould. Everyone's got physical limitations. Everyone's got mental limitations. And you kind of have to adapt and you have to turn that golfer into the golfer that they are. Mm. They're already that golfer. You just need to refine it and make them understand that it's okay to be themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to play their golf. Completely. And something that I go on a lot about is this is your game. Golf is your game. It's the game you need it to be. It's the game you want it to be. And you can own it Mm -hmm. once you are accepting of it and you don't care what anyone else thinks. Well, that is the quest (laughs) that I'm on at the moment. So I became aware of you, Katie, uh, right back when I first designed, uh, was formulating the plan and the idea for Golf Yourself Healthy. I read your article in Golf Monthly about your son, Teddy. Yeah. And I'll be really honest with you in saying that um, I, it wasn't until, you know, however many weeks ago that was now, Janelle, like I say, who, who I've interviewed for this podcast recently, you know, we were chatting about people. I said, I'm always open to, to suggestions for people to come on the podcast. And, and she mentioned you. And I, it reminded me the reason maybe why I didn't approach you right back at the start which I think is a really important thing that I want to share with you, which is this idea of how uncomfortable it can be to talk about grief mm. and how I talk about, you know, I've shared openly about since I lost my son, Innes, I wish people knew what to say to me. Yeah. And I almost didn't, I didn't want to approach you because I thought, how's, how's Katie going to receive that mm. kind of thing that I've, am I going to make her feel sad or uncomfortable? Yeah. 
But I'm fundamentally extremely grateful that I'm sat now here in front of you <laughs> because these are the conversations that matter. Yeah. For me, you know, so can you tell us a bit about your son Teddy and his story? Yeah, so um, it was Teddy was born in 2015. My daughter was three. Was she three? She was two. She was two and a bit. And we'd struggled for a long time to have her. We had IVF to have her. And then Teddy was a bit of a blessing. He came along just naturally, which is amazing how Mother Nature works. And we had, he was born in January, January the 9th. And we had the most incredible year. You know, we went places. We were so happy to have a little boy. Christmas Eve came round and his nappy was a bit blush. So I thought, oh God, he's got a urine infection. And our doctors were at White Parish Surgery in Wiltshire and they, they're phenomenal. You phone up and they'll see you straight away. They're brilliant. It was, that's quite rare, I think. So I whizzed him in and they were like, and, and I'd taken a sample with me as well because I knew they'd ask for one. And I thought they'll, they'll get us antibiotics and we can, you know, crack on with Christmas. And it turned out there was so much blood in his urine that we went to Salisbury Hospital for blood tests. And I remember him scoffing a cheese sandwich, just smiling, laughing. He got an amazing couple of presents from the children's ward. It was, it was really lovely. They did blood tests and they said, come back. So we went back Boxing Day and they did a few other tests. They did scans. And it turns out he had a big mass in his bladder, which they thought was just a blood clot. But I can remember to this day the consultant's face when she said, has he always had that head tilt? And we'd never thought anything of it. He's the happiest little boy going. And I just remember her face and she just looked flawed, absolutely flawed. And it wasn't until a few days later when we then, it turned out it wasn't a blood clot. They sent us to Pye and Brown to the Southampton General. And we pretty much we came home for a little bit I think but we pretty much didn't leave hospital he ended up he had rhabdoid tumors so they tend to have a smart b1 it's a genetic thing usually from the parents we were clear we had tests done but yeah so we left pie and brown there was nothing they could do the the it was such a fast growing tumor in his bladder that it would have been horrendous but he also had a big tumor on his brain after various scans and things and I think we got to about the 15th of January and they said do you want to go to Naomi House which was the hospice that I've always always supported and yeah Teddy died on the 20th of January so quick so quick and I think even now I'll say to people it was such an aggressive cancer and there was no chance of us having any treatment. But I, I met so many mums through bereavement groups through Naomi House. And they had years and years of treatment. And they still lost their children. Mm -hmm. And you kind of go, and this is that, i am always been a super, super positive person anyway. And I will kind of even say, I mean, it was horrendous what happened, but I could do nothing about it. I can't change it. And I do think that, my sports psychology side of things. I mean, I sat in the bed on Pye and Brown Ward in the general and wrote one of my articles for the magazine Tea Times about why we should all love golf. And it was for February. So it was coinciding with the Valentine's thing. Love golf. But it was so heartfelt. And I read back through it the other day and it does floor you because I remember where I was sat writing it. And I remember just saying to people, this is a game. Get some perspective. And hopefully it didn't sound too patronising or anything like that. But no one knew where I was writing it from. But I just said, just remember that you're out here to enjoy yourselves. Make sure when you finish your round, give each other a pat on the back, tell them they've played well, remind them of their good shots and smile. Because you are so blessed to play this game. It's an incredible thing and we can get so much from it. So it's, it's just nuts looking back that I was sat in a children's cancer ward writing that I'd, I'd challenge you to say it's it's not nuts or I've had to tell yeah. myself that because well firstly I'm I'm sorry for your loss and thank you for talking about it uh, and and uh, the reason I say I don't think that's nuts is because golf yourself healthy as a name and as a whole concept was born in the maternity ward when mm. we had Innes 
And at the time, I thought to myself, are you seriously using your son's like mem like you know as your justification for like a, you know yeah, what I mean? It's kind of like it was. I was like only an obsessed golfer could be thinking about getting out in the golf course, having literally just had his son stillborn kind of mm -hmm. thing. But but no, you know, it's when I hear someone like you share what you've just shared and the way you've just shared it that mm. it proves to me that that there are people out there like us who see yeah. this game in this way, you know? And I, I think after it happened, I was coaching at Cowdery Park at the time. And after it happened, I went back to golf quite quickly. It happened in January, and I think I was doing golf school in April. So that's fast, but I, I wanted distraction. I wanted to be busy. And looking back at it now, I probably not postponed my grief because you're constantly grieving but I definitely made sure I was busy and distracted myself massively. And coaching other people and helping other people enjoy a game and therefore be happier in life was quite a big thing to me. And I think after it happened, I think my coaching changed. I don't think I was so obsessed with score anymore. I wasn't obsessed with helping people drop handicaps and become better golfers as such. I became much more sure that I was helping them enjoy it and be happier and really appreciate what golf can give them and that almost idea that golf is an escape for some people and I think that's probably why you wanted to go onto the golf course because it does sometimes feel like you can escape because the distraction of having to knock a little white dimply thing around a golf course you can't really think about anything else can you no but you know what you know, I've had other guests on who, who say exactly that, you know, people who have lost children, for example, and what golf's given them and they describe it as an escape. I actually, I, it was partly that for me, but it actually was a place where I wanted to go play on my own to have a space to remember my son, to think yeah. about him. To allow yourself to the allow, time. To allow myself the time without distraction, almost. You can't do that on a squash court, can you? No, you can't. <laughs> because that's, that's properly escaping. Yeah, that's switching off. But there's something, I think, very intentional about playing golf and going mm. out and kind of, again, coming back to why you play it. And my why in that case was, I want to go remember him, you know, just channel his memory, stand over a drive and say, do it for Innes, you know, yeah. and... And it helps, and, I, and I'm not sure I do it enough anymore, just because, again, you know, how, because I was going to say, I, I find myself, what, I almost a year and a half on now from losing him, and things happen in your life, and your grief goes through. Did you find that? Like, did your grief go through I, I was going to say, I think, um, and I when we t when we spoke last time we spoke, I think I said to you that, a year and a half is so early in. And people, I think people who haven't gone through huge loss or loss that's out of order, if that makes sense. So loss that has happened sooner than it should happen in the grand scheme of life. So, you know, you expect to lose your grandparents. We expect to eventually lose our parents. We expect that there's a natural order to stuff. When you lose a child, I don't think people understand how out of sync that is and how there's it's not just about losing what could have been and their life that they could have had and all the experiences that you have to watch other children go through you think they should be doing that they should be doing that it's it's about that part that you just go well, it's not supposed to happen like this and I think something that I've learned as well is that things aren't supposed to happen in an order there's not a book that says this is life, mm. this happens, this happens. I think when we grow up, that's what we assume. We assume there's an order to everything. And it's only as you go through these experiences that you realise that you're constantly painting your own picture. You're constantly taking your own route on your own journey through life. And I think with the golf yourself healthy and with golf as a sport, I think a lot of people don't understand how much it can nourish your life. Not necessarily in that 18 hole format, if you want to go there for a long time, brilliant, but it can nourish your life in just going to one of these simulators and just getting that feeling that hitting a good golf shot gives you. There are so many elements to it that can really enhance and help. Mm. And yeah, I think that 
stages of grief is a re- something that I've not become fascinated by, or I suppose I have been obsessed by more than anything, is that it is different for people. And there are certain points in grief that happen. And I remember, I think I said this to you before, at Naomi House, they talked to us a few days. We were there for five days with Teddy before he passed away. And I remember speaking to the bereavement counsellors, to the chaplain, to the nurses about what we were going to expect. And I think from a journey point of view, one of the things that they said is your husband and yourself will be grieving. You're both going to be grieving, but you're going to be in different stages at the whole time. You may be on the same page, but you're going to be on different parts of the page. Or you may be in the same book, but you might be on different chapters. And don't ever try and understand where that other person is. Always just give them a hug, give them what they need. Ask them, what do you want me to do? What do, I, what do you need at the moment? And I think that's probably what meant that my husband Ben and I are still very much together, stronger than ever. And it's because we were given help and advice early on. Hmm. But I do feel like we were lucky because in a sense, and everyone says, you cannot say that you were lucky, you lost your son. But I think we were lucky to be given the tools, or at least some of them, to be able to kind of know how to function afterwards, know not to have any regrets. So we did all the memory making and everything else. I think that makes a big difference. We've each got a silver necklace. But I do think we then went on a very different journey individually My husband, if anyone mentioned Teddy's name in the first year, was in pieces on the school run. When he just, just like, you know, if he was Mm. at preschool picking up Libby, someone mentioned his name or asked him about it, he burst into tears, which I think is a phenomenally strong thing for any man to be able to do anyway. And we've said before, people, men should cry more. But I mean, Ben was lit for the first year, and I was a bit more, I've got to be strong. I've got to carry on. Libby's still got to go to preschool. I've got to go to work. I'm grieving, but I'm cracking on. And it wasn't actually till lockdown, so probably four years later, that I lost it. (laughs) And I think it's because as we're in lockdown, there was too much time to think. I couldn't go to work. I had to be at home. Mm -hmm. And I had to be where he was. And it's amazing how grief catches up with you and you can't do anything about it. You can't, you can't know, you can't predict it. Mm. You've just got to take each day as it comes. Yeah. And I think, like you said, golf is a good way of almost tempting that out. Yeah. Because it's good to cry. It's good. To, I, I don't think I probably broke, properly broke down in public until my husband and I went away to Celtic Manor. For a weekend of golf and I hadn't gone on a golf course I was really scared to go on a golf course because to me that idea of having lots of time to escape was scary I thought what we've been through is huge and I knew it was and I knew I'd be sta- I'd been stashing it away and being strong I was really scared of what might happen if it came out mm-hmm. so I didn't play golf because it's too much time for me to think about stuff and to speculate and worry and allow myself to let go and I was in a bunker and I'm really good at bunkers love bunker play <laughs> what were you saying earlier about bunker. striding into the bunker I, I strode into that bunker yeah. and I went right wiggle my feet and this is coming out and I thinned it into the face and it came back and hit me in the leg and dropped down my husband didn't have a clue what was going on he was on the other side of the green doing his chip shot I went oh whatever we'll do it again and it didn't come out again and I was like um this isn't right And it really, really annoyed me. And it annoyed me. And then I just, and I think it happened three times. I was obviously squeezing the life out of the club. Something wasn't happening. I couldn't get out of the bunker. And I absolutely sat down and I sobbed. And it wasn't because I couldn't get out of the bunker. It was because we'd lost our son. And that was probably, I don't know, six months prior. So, yeah, it's just, it is grief's fascinating Mm -hmm. and really fragile as well so anyone going through grief we talked about like the time scale people assume a year in and that you're okay you've got over it yeah well it's okay now you can move on you never move on no you don't of course not you learn from it i'll make sure i share 
the link in the show notes of this episode to that that article that you wrote because I I remember you talking mm. about that you compared it to like the sand on like a Cornish beach or something did you not like the yeah, yeah and I um you know you, you telling that story I, I I've shared this in a previous episode of this is uh, this podcast that back in April I was in Ireland with a very good friend of mine and uh, who's been a wonderful support to me since losing Innes and his dad and. His dad, who I, I I didn't know very well, and again that whole man thing. Oh, I've got a bit can't show emotion, whatever kind mm. of thing. But we were all, um, playing uh, at a place called the Island on day three, and links course weather was horrendous. We're getting beat up out in the golf course, kind of thing. And I was thinking about Innes, and normally when I think about him, it's beautiful thoughts. Mm. But I was feeling really dark that day, and it just caught up in me. And my friend Andy catches up. I just looked at him, I said, I, I don't feel okay, Andy. He was like, oh, mate, look, I know the conditions are horrendous out here. But it's not like, about the it's golf. It's not about the golf. <laughs> I'm, thinking oh. about, I'm thinking about Innes, yeah. you know? And to your point, grief gets you in a moment when you least expect it. Massively. You can be weeks or months down the line and you think you're hunky-dory and you, oh, I've cracked this now and I'm in a good place and then boom brings you back down to earth right it's usually when someone's kind so if someone like at the till it mm. i remember losing it in tesco before where someone at the till has just asked you okay how's your day going sure. and whether it's the whether it's the tone of voice or whether it's how well meaning that person's been you've bottled everything up to now you've got your shop done i think i've got everything on my list right let's go we've got to do this we've got to do that and then someone and it's it i think when it happened to me, it was a lady who was probably in her late 60s, early 70s. And it just felt like she was putting her arms around me just by asking that question. I mm. bloody lost it. Yeah. She thought, oh my God, are you okay? I said, it's not about the baked beans. It's just, it's just been a bit crap recently. And she went, don't worry, I'm, I get it. Yeah. And it turned out she'd lost a child. So, I mean, obviously the people behind me are going, this is not a counselling area. We, I, I need to pay for my shopping. But we just... It didn't have to take long, but those little moments, I really mm-hmm. treasure. So I will always speak to people now. I'll ask them how their day is. I always did before, I think. But I don't think I was as well-meaning with it because you don't know what everyone's going through. And this people mask their grief. And so someone who's... And I've said it to members at golf clubs where they've gone, oh, she's got a right problem. She's an absolute nightmare. So have you asked her what's going on? Yeah. Have you asked her whether there's something in her life that's... And it will turn out that her husband committed suicide or something has happened that has made her really defensive because she doesn't want to deal with it. And maybe she needs someone to ask if she's all right. Yeah. And I think that golf clubs could learn a lot from actually listening to people like ourselves actually, A, tell our stories, be related to golf Mm -hmm. and see maybe help people walk out of that room going, yeah, I'm going to change a couple of things. And I really appreciate stuff a bit more and just maybe just be a little bit kinder. Yeah, I totally agree. And hopefully you and I can play our part in uh, in, (laughs) in helping with that. And just another thing just to round out on this is, you know, what you were saying there about that, you know, lady in, in, in Tesco, I think it was, you said, you know, that is a, a reason why I think I want to and should and, and you know, intend to continue talking about Innes because by not mm. and by, you know, I have a choice. Every time someone says, you know, so for instance, as you know, Kim and I are pregnant again, June, baby girl, June, November, and you'll tell people, um, often gets followed up with, is it your first? Yeah, and, and I, I, I get and I asked, say, how many children have you got? And yeah. yeah, and I say, no, Yeah, we lost our son last year. Mm. And, and, that, and the reason, part of the reason I do that is to the thing you were just saying is because you just never know by sharing that what you get back from the other person, yeah. which is I've lost a child too. Yeah, exactly. And then that bond and that shared connection and it takes all the, you know, it's a, that's a powerful experience. Um, but also, yeah, what you give to that person too mm. by being so brave and courageous to share it in the first place. Yeah. You know, yeah. some people it's are... so important. Yeah, yeah. It's so, and I think, like, when people say, how many children have you got? And I do think as well, when you're asked questions like that, 
And I've been asked questions like that. And I felt guilty afterwards because I've just not felt strong on that day. And they've said, how many children have you got? And I said, two. I've got, you know. And, and you just think, today, I haven't got it in me to really go into it. And you, that's okay as well. Yeah. But the majority of the time I'll say I've got, and, and you know, I've, I've said all sorts of versions of it before, but I've got my daughter's 11, my son would be nine, and my little boy Finn is six. Mm-hmm. And they say, oh, so you've got three. I said, well, my, my two children I have got, but we very sadly lost Teddy. Yeah. And I will really talk about it. And nine times out of ten, they don't shut the conversation down as you'd expect them to. Yeah. And I think that's the expectation is that people are going to not want to talk to you now because they don't know what to say. But I've been really pleasantly surprised. And I think it's because I can read people and I can read whether they're going to be receptive to me telling them that mm. or whether I'm just going to scare them off. Yeah. And it's <laughs> it's such a, there's always a judgment call that you, so again, like, uh, it's so it's so important what you're saying here uh, at an individual level because to protect yourself almost you have to make a judgment sometimes mm. like like you say on that day is it really what vibe am I getting from this person is it yeah. really worth my while opening up in this way to that person yeah. because are they going to give me back what I need exactly why coming back to why why am I even sharing like you know yeah uh, I don't need to share it with that person but. No, you know, exactly. But, but sometimes you share it with the person that you questioned and you kind of went, I don't really want to share this. But then you end up sharing it and you're so, they're the ones that suddenly will surprise you. Yes, I Because a lot of the time they're yeah. masking yeah. stuff. But that that's what I do in my golf lessons. I have to, I've always said I have to read the person that steps in front of me in the first couple of minutes. I have mm-hmm. to kind of get a feel for them and get to know them very quickly. And quite often we end up talking about so many other things within that lesson. And often they actually, yes, they need to get better at golf, but they actually want someone to talk to. Mm -hmm. And I feel, and you'll be the same, in quite a powerful position in the sense that I've I've got so much to give. Mm -hmm. I can really help people on that journey. Mm -hmm. And if they happen to have something going on in life, they need to give that thing a bit of a nod and actually allow that to affect their golf or at least accept that it is affecting their golf mm. and therefore not bother too much about the score. Use golf as a distraction, like we said mm. earlier. And I think that for me is probably the thing that I walk away from lesson going, I feel great about that. I've just helped that person realise that the score isn't important at the moment. It will be. But by letting go of it and by allowing golf to be your escape, mm you're going to improve Mm. because you let it go a little bit. remember reading, I think it was a book at A-level or GCSE in English literature called Letting the Balloon Go. And if you ever heard of that, I think it was called Letting the Balloon Go. Might have been King of the Castle. But it was all about, it was all metaphorical. It was a story, but there was so much. And I remember looking at the text. I'm going to have to find it when I get home now. But I had so many little notes. And I was the person that didn't use the line in exam papers for one sentence. It was for three. <laughs> I, could, I wanted to fit as much and say as much about characters and things like that as possible. But this letting the balloon go was almost like uh, this child held onto this balloon so tight because they were so scared about letting it go. Mm. And actually, when they did let it go, there was this kind of relief of, oh, I don't have to worry about it anymore. I don't have to worry about squeezing that. Um, string so hard I've put fingernail marks in the palm of my hand and I think grief's a little bit like that we scare ourselves and like me on the golf course scare ourselves into going oh god I don't want to let it go I'm a bit scared what might happen and when you do it's okay and Hmm. you actually feel better about yourself and better about everything as a result so yeah I think golf going back to your golf yourself healthy Golf yourself healthy. Can't put my teeth in. <laughs> um, I think a lot of, a big chunk of that is going to be about people allowing themselves to use golf for that rather than it being for just a score. Yeah. Or it's a handicap or it's a competition win or a cup or a trophy or whatever. Using golf, actually utilising it to nourish their lives. Yeah. And I think that's probably one of the most important elements. And that's one of the reasons that we're talking today. Completely. Absolutely. 
Katie, I could talk to you for hours. I know, but we, it'll go dark. I can't, you can't, <laughs> we can't. You've got lessons to give this afternoon. I do. But thank you. Thank you. I hope for to have me. you back on again at some point and, you know, continue the the great work that I think we're doing together. And yes. To, yeah, and hopefully you'll come on the podcast that I do with Liz um, Harwood for Birdie's Banter because we want the guys on and I think your message is so important to actually, you know, use use emotions and utilise them to help other people. Yeah. I think that's a really important message. So yes, I'd be honoured. Thank that you. That would be amazing. Thank you very much for listening. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Remember, if you liked what you heard and you'd like to hear more episodes from Golf Yourself Healthy, please make sure to follow us on your podcast platform of choice. Something a bit different that I want to try with you, our listeners, is if you listen on Spotify, you will notice that there is a comment section where you can leave a comment, add some words about what you enjoyed about this particular episode, or if you have any ideas, feedback, comments in general for future episodes or things you would like us to talk about in the Golf Yourself Healthy podcast. If you don't listen on Spotify, because we are an inclusive bunch here, we're available really on all podcast platforms. You can do the same thing by contacting me on email on chris at golfyourselfhealthy.com. My email address is in the show notes, so you can get in touch directly through that. But as ever, and until the next time, always remember to embrace the rough and forever cherish the fairway.